Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks everyone for joining us today to talk about flourishing and specifically for this panel, how uh, flourishing changes as we age. What are some of the different challenges and opportunities across the lifespan in different parts of the world and different cultures? Uh, so it's a, it's going to be a really interesting discussion. Uh, my name is Laura Helmuth. I'm the editor-in-chief of Scientific American. So we are the oldest continuously published magazine in the United States. Uh, we've been around since 1845. Our first, our first issue um, was all about the telegram, um, or te sorry, telegraph. And uh, more recently, we, you know, we cover space telescopes, uh, and we cover a lot of research on social science, on um, the research behind social justice, on flourishing, on gaslighting, on all kinds of psychological and sociological and anthropological uh, issues. And, um, and flourishing is, is a field that we're really hoping to do more with. And it's been exciting to, to see this conference. Um, so we're going to um, have three, you know, one video presentation and then um, two other two two panelists who will be here to, to speak with us and have a bigger conversation. We want to hear your questions, too. Um, so please do at any point during this panel, uh, submit your questions. We'll reserve some time at the end to get to those. So to introduce our speakers, uh, we're going to start out with a with a video uh, from Arthur Brooks. So he is um, a professor of the practice of public leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School and the professor of management practice at the Harvard Business School. And he's going to talk to us, um, share some of the highlights from his very popular class about happiness that he teaches at Harvard. Uh, he's a behavioral social scientist and an author. So uh, we'll start out with a video from him, and then we'll have a, a bigger discussion that, that I think will uh, kind of focus more on, on issues about, about flourishing as we age. And um, our first speaker uh, will be Tom Osborne. Uh, so Tom is from Kenya. He is a, a social entrepreneur, a community mobilizer, a mental health innovator, and a thought leader. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about some of his work as a mental health pioneer and um, the institute he started called the Shamiri Institute, which provides world-class mental health to people, to young people in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, our other panelist today is Anna Corwin. Uh, so she is an associate professor of women's spirituality and anthropology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, she studies how everyday practices shape people's experiences of well-being as we age. Um, she's the author of the book, uh, Embracing Age, How Catholic Nuns Became Models of Well-Being. Uh, she studies uh, the perception and enskillment um, as an interaction with the divine. And some of her, her newest projects are funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation. So um, we're, we're eager to hear how, how her work fits in uh, with, with the rest of all the issues we're talking about uh, yesterday and today. So let's go ahead and start with Arthur Brooks's uh, video presentation. And unfortunately, he won't be here for, to discuss, but it's a nice launching point for the larger discussion we'll have. Thanks a lot. Arthur Brooks here. I'm delighted to be part of the Templeton World Charity Foundation's Global Scientific Conference on, on Human Flourishing. There's a lot that we can talk about in this conference. There's, this encompasses so much about human life, happiness, fulfillment, human flourishing. What are they? And, and that's really where probably we should start the conversation. That's certainly where I start the conversation in my classes on the science of human happiness that I teach at Harvard University. Um, these are oversubscribed classes because everybody has a sense that human flourishing is something they want more of. They want to feel more fulfilled. They want, they want to be happier. We all want to be happier. Aristotle talked about that. St. Thomas Aquinas talked about that. It's true. Now, not everybody acts like they want to be happier, but we do. So what do we mean by that? That's the first question that I ask on the first day of class in my leadership and happiness class at the Harvard Business School. What is happiness? We go around the room a little bit. I mean, there's 180 students. We don't go around the room. That would take the whole semester. But I, I cold call people. I say, you, okay, you took this class. You spent all your elective points on it. We have a bidding system. And what is it? You must know what it is. And they say, well, happiness, it's the feeling I get when I'm around the people I love. Or it's the feeling I get when I'm doing something I enjoy. And I say, wrong. Happiness is not a feeling any more than then your Thanksgiving turkey is the smell of the dinner. That's not right. The smell is evidence that Thanksgiving is here and that your mother's doing something special. Um, and feelings are evidence of happiness. Feelings are not happiness. Happiness, according to the best research, can be broken apart into more or less three big areas. And, and 
it doesn't matter if you call it happiness or human flourishing or, or something else. It's really a combination of three macronutrients, if you will. Now, I use that under advisement. You know, I used the Thanksgiving metaphor a minute ago. The Thanksgiving dinner is, is made up of three macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. I mean, I realize that's not a very um, family way to think of it. Mom, pass the carbohydrates. I mean, that's, that's not what your Thanksgiving is going to look like, I hope. But that technically is true. And the same thing is true about your human flourishing. The same thing is true about happiness. You can, you can take the happiest people and you'll find that they have three macronutrients and balance and abundance. And this is what we need to study as a scientific matter. They are enjoyment, satisfaction, and meaning. If you're missing one of these macronutrients, you won't be as happy as you can be. If you have all of them in balance and abundance, you'll be basically living your best life. And this is the reason that almost every happiness researcher is specializing in one or more of these macronutrients. How to live a life that you enjoy, which is not a life of pleasure, by the way. Pleasure doesn't bring happiness. That's animal. Pleasure plus human elevation. Uh, moving the experience of pleasure from the limbic system of the brain to the prefrontal cortex where it can garner memories and build relationships. That's real enjoyment. And that has a whole literature behind it. Satisfaction, the joy that comes from a, uh, the reward for something you worked for, a job well done, a goal met, that joy that we all get, that, that's an even bigger area of research. Why? Because, well, as Mick Jagger saying, I can't get no satisfaction. He was wrong, by the way. You can get it. The problem is that you can't keep no satisfaction. And that's because of a whole uh, cognitive process called homeostasis in which the brain resets from all pleasures, from all human emotions and desires and cravings so you can be ready for the next set of circumstances. That's the reason you can't keep no satisfaction. All whole literature talks about why the brain does that, how to try to get around that, how to not build a frustrating life. Boy, do we need more research on satisfaction. Hmm. It's one of the big mysteries of life, isn't it? And then, then there's meaning. This is the biggest paradox of them all, meaning. People always ask almost as a joke, what's the meaning of life? Which is the wrong question. The right question, according to philosophers and social psychologists, is what's the meaning of meaning? Meaning really has three parts. Coherence, why do things happen? Purpose, what's the direction of my life? And significance. Why am I alive? Answer those questions and you really find meaning. But answering those questions doesn't actually only involve happiness. It also requires pain and suffering and challenges. I have dear friends who've had life-threatening illnesses and they're better and bigger people for it. They don't want those life-threatening illnesses, but their sense of meaning and who they are as people have come from them. Suffering is sacred. Happiness requires unhappiness, and it all comes through the challenge of meaning. And so the most philosophical of all of the macronutrients of happiness is meaning. What do we need? We need a big, comprehensive research agenda, multifaceted, where the biggest brains and the biggest hearts come together to enjoy, to enjoy life, to find the secrets of satisfaction, and to understand the deep philosophy where we find the meaning in our lives. Well... I couldn't be happier that TWCF is on this case, and I'm really, really honored to be part of it myself. So let's get to work, because the world needs more happiness. Great. Thanks so much to Arthur for his perspective. Um, I really like the the ingredients metaphor. Um, that seems like a really rich way to think about things. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all the fathers and other you know, non-mother cooks who create Thanksgiving and other feasts around the world. Uh, it's uh, it's something we can all do. Um, but uh, yeah, that was really interesting. So I think we want to want to turn now to to um, to Tom and Anna. And Tom, could you start us off? Could you tell us a little bit more about your work? Uh, on human flourishing and particularly with with young people. Great, thank you so much for having me here. Really excited to be part of this, um, you know, wonderful conference on, on human flourishing. Um, so the work that we do at, at Shamiri um, is that we actually think about the, ing the ingredient, you know, metaphor and ask ourselves, um, what are the ingredients that we, that young people need to flourish and how can we package those as, simple practical interventions that can be implemented um, at scale 
to maximize the ability of young people to flourish. So, so Shamiri means uh, thrive in Kiswahili. Um, and basically what we want to do is to develop scale um, interventions, character strength interventions that promote human flourishing, especially amongst um, adolescents age 12, 19 years old. Oh, that's great. Um, mm -hmm. And then, yeah, Anna, could you give us a, a kind of an introduction to some of the work that you're doing these days? Sure, yeah. Um, I I love that we're on a panel on aging that is including the life course at, at all of these stages. So I work at the other end of the life course. Um, I'm an anthropologist. I have spent the past 14 years working with a community who has been upheld by epidemiologists. There's a lot of data showing that this community, Catholic American Catholic nuns, age more successfully than the rest of us. So they have all these wonderful health outcomes. They live longer, they're healthier, they're happier at the end of life, fewer instances of Alzheimer's. They were on the cover of American Catholic nuns were on the cover of uh, Time magazine a number of years ago for their health outcomes. And my work as an anthropologist, so there's all this quantitative work that shows correlations between the nuns' healthy aging outcomes and their social practices, their linguistic practices, what they're doing every day. And so that's what my work is looking at. What is it um, why is it that these women um, are aging so well? What is what are they doing? And so, um, and and I would say, you know, just having watched Arthur Brooks's um, talk just now, I would say, just like he is identifying that happiness is not a, a feeling that that's kind of a, a red herring. Well being at the end of life is not what we think it is. Often, the way um, we think about aging and well being in the way we talk about it in medical discourses and public discourses um, in most industrialized spaces around the world, we tend to talk about aging with ingredients that essentially amount to not aging or avoiding aging or being a, you know, an, an ageless adult who continues to be productive and independent for as long as possible. Um, but my work shows, you know, first of all, those are cultural ideals those are not necessary those don't actually and what we find when we actually look at these communities not just catholic nuns that's where most of my own work but actually communities around the world where people are actually aging well it turns out that the secret is that they are not trying to avoid aging that they are actually doing tremendous amount of linguistic and cultural practices around embracing aging and the end of life as a unique life stage. So just like childhood in most communities around the world is understood as a valuable life stage that is different than adulthood. We don't expect children. We don't think of them as deficient adults, or hopefully we don't. Um, similarly, <laughs> sometimes we do in certain spaces, but similarly, the people who ate, who have the best health outcomes at the end of life see the end of life, that life stage as actually a, a time of life where that is distinct, that there were aging itself is seen as natural and is embraced and is actually, um, there's a, a um, there's practices around learning how to do aging together. Um, so that, that's what my, um, and that to me, that's what flourishing looks like. It looks like not avoiding aging, but actually embracing it in these communities. Oh, that's wonderful. And and Tom, in your work, it does you know at, at the other end in your 12 to 19 year olds, is that an explicit part of of um of the discussions that you have with with these people about um you know what it's like to be not quite an adult or just beginning to be an adult and, and how that's different from other life stages? Um yes, but I think in a very different capacity. So I think the 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 challenge we have or the opportunity we have in 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 Kenya, in similar contexts, as we have a very youthful population. So the median age is 19, for example, in Kenya, and, and more than 50% of the population is aged 20 and below. Uh, and so you have this very huge scale of the population in this really formative um, 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 age period. And one consequence of that is um, maybe unlike other cultures and other contexts in the world, this um, age group, 12 to 19, can be quite the determinant of one's future life prospects. Just to you know, give you 
you know, kind of a more concrete example, um, Realms in Kenya, um, there are about, um, I think, 50,000 slots in university for um, about 500,000 graduating students every year. Uh, and so as you are an adolescent getting close to 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 the end of high school, getting ready for the transition into adulthood, uh, there's a lot of, you know, kind of social pressure um, from friends, from family, from the community, um, because basically a lot of these decisions that you can do um, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, you know, an adolescent can really, you know, be determinative of, of your future life. And so the question for us is, in this um, crucible of pressure, how can we cultivate an environment where young people can not just quote unquote survive and not just you know um, transition to to adults, but but can flourish you know and 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 kind of have you know the ingredients like um, meaning that um, we, we we heard about in the video um, and enjoyment you know as part of the um, Socio cultural, you know, kind of environments to be able to, you know, just really get the best out of this, you know, kind of pre formative age. So, so, um, it's, it's to, to some extent, you know, the same is just like us, uh, slightly different because what we're experiencing in Kenya is, is most young people in this age see this time period as, you know, do or die, which is often not the case, but, but, but is the perception, um, um, that is pre rather predominant. Yeah, there's so much pressure. I mean, I think for any teenagers, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure to you know, make decisions about your career and your family and where you live. Um, but yeah, it, must, it sounds like it's especially acute right now in Kenya. Yeah, and and I think one thing is, and maybe it's just bringing it globally, um, also young people are, um, I think it'll be a great conversation to have with Anna as well, uh, where you think the main difference, I'd say, between this time frame and, and aging is um aging as to a lot of extent in my opinion remain you know kind of like constant whereas what it means to be young now is very different you know the kind of decision that young people have to make now is very different from decisions i had to make when i was young and most of us had to make when we we're young you know um the social environment that we find ourselves in you know with you know um technology you know with extreme you know competition just because it's also every year there's way more of us you know existing in this in this planet right presents new challenges to 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 to, to flourishing um and, and just requires that we are very robust and very active in, in studying flourishing amongst young people because even yesterday's knowledge may not be very relevant today because the dynamics keep changing and evolving rather rapidly yeah yeah, it's hard to it's hard to keep up. I mean, it's so exciting, I mean, and it must be fun for you, working with youth culture. To uh, you must be learning new you know new slang terms and and new cultural <laughs> memes and and things all the time. Um, and, and so Anna, with with your so with with the with the population that you work with, um, with the nuns, do you see you know do they do they have any lessons from their kind of twelve to nineteen phase that might be relevant for the people that Tom works with? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, well, there was a fascinating study that David Snowden and some others did that found the, where they looked at the language that young Catholic, that Catholic nuns who were now in their 80s or older had written. So they had written, the nuns had written these, um, I think they were life history interview or something. They had been writing as young novices and postulants. And they looked at the language and then looked at the health outcomes of the older sisters. And they found these remarkable correlations between the nun, the sisters who had really positive em emotional words in, in their narratives had more positive health outcomes at the end of oh. life and lower instances of Alzheimer's. So that kind of the attitude, I mean, what it seems to indicate, it's a really interesting study, but that, but it seems to indicate that there's, well, it's sort of the causal question is, is harder to say of why were the, who, what's the difference of who was writing in that way, but there seems to be some correlation between outlook as young people and, and then outcomes as older adults. Um, absolutely. And, you know, the, there's one thing that I'm, 
I'm writing a paper on right now that, that, you know, Tom's work makes me think about or Tom's discussion of how rapidly everything is changing. I mean, things are also changing rapidly for our older adults. You know, this world is a really, it's, we're in a moment of just massive change. And um, one of the, I'm, a Catholic nuns in particular are in a moment of, of a really interesting um, demographic decline where the number of, of sisters is plummeting. And so there's, and so that means that convents are closing, they don't have the funds to take care of older sisters. And one of the things that I'm noticing that's, that's fascinating is the way that the nuns have the same attitude that they have cultivated that helps them address aging with acceptance and helps them flourish as they're individually. So what I find in my work on aging is that individually sisters um, have, they, there's all this linguistic and cultural practices that they do that they can rely on so that when they're encountering pain or when they're experiencing, you know, the, the real grief of end of life, they have so much to rely on to around acceptance and grace and relying on each other and community. And these same practices that they employ when they're dealing with their own deaths, they're actually employing as a community, as larger scale communities, as institutions, as they're looking for and planning for institutional decline and death. And so there's these practices of simultaneously cultivating really pragmatic, difficult decisions, like we're going to have to sell parts of the convent, we might have to move, but then simultaneously um, cultivating what maybe Dasher Kelton was studying about earlier, um, practices of awe that then allow them to sort of lean into, um, you know, being able to flourish while their whole institution is declining. And the practices themselves are just um, phenomenal to witness. Um, and, and really instructive, I think, in some, in major ways. Yeah, and just to, you know, um, add to the conversation, I think the two themes from what you're saying, you know, practices and, and outlook uh, are also very evident, you know, kind of like, um, um, you know, Aknan and, and sites, it, it was really fascinating when you're talking about the, the study, the correlations about, you know, kind of outlook when you're young um, and how it affects um, you when, you, when you're aging, because actually that is one of the things that we try to to tap in um, in in some of the interventions that we do with young people is can we you know change their um, outlook you know kind of um, about things can we make them see you know um, uh, opportunity out of difficulty you know can we make them see problems as you know opportunity for 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 growth you know um, can we change how they think about the future um and 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 beyond just you know changing the outlook also um allowing them to develop and cultivate practices that they can use to navigate you know especially the difficult moments um of life when they're having challenges you know because you can have great outlook but you need you need toolkits you know and i think the, um um these practices are the, some of these toolkits, you know, like, you know, um, problem solving, practicing gratitude, developing, you know, kind of a growth mindset, taking value aligned action, et cetera. And just training people to, to, to be able to have the tools to practice this. And I think, um, and I, I can just, you, you know, just, um, of course we, we will need causal evidence, but at least on my mind, it, it makes sense why if you develop you know, there's this outlook and some of his practices or when you're young, you know, it, it will to a lot of extent carry, you know, kind of throw your throughout your life. So, so I, I think this as you begun um is a very great panel because you're looking at it from both ends, but you're seeing that there is a core um that 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 unites, you know, both the the, the cultures and the populations that we're working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd love to hear more from, from both of you about maybe some practical advice that anybody in the audience at any age or or for specific ages, you know, some of the practices, some of the daily practices and experiences that that you've seen seem to make a difference that people could, you know, could try to adopt as much as they have control over that. Do you, do you have advice for, for people in the audience? Um, yeah, I can go fast. Um... 
Yes, I think the great thing about human flourishing and the science of, of human flourishing is that often great solutions are very easy, very accessible, and just part of our normal, you know, quote unquote human fabric. Um, and I'll give three, you know, kind of practical examples. So the first is there's a lot of, you know, scientific evidence that, you know, people who practice gratitude, you know, tend to exhibit more positive states, I think now almost across the whole, you know, um, lifespan. Um, and that is a very, you know, small, but potentially potent uh, practice that we can embed in, 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 in our daily lives that can really, you know, cultivate our own, you know, um, individual flourishing. Um, I think the second that, you know, kind of comes to uh, mind and just tying this to the to the to the video that we were we were listening to at the beginning um from this idea of 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 meaning us of having some sense of um of of purpose and I think the great thing about that is um and I was trying to honest you know um example with with nuns who have to make really tough decisions is that in these moments in life when we make tough decisions being more cognizant and being more aware of, you know, um, what matters to us, you know, what gives us meaning and using this to align our decision making, you know, can also help buffer and and help really um, strengthen how we feel, especially when we go through moments where we have to make very, you know, kind of tough decisions. Those are two um, um, ideas, you know, kind of come to mind. Uh, and yes, finally, also just being more you know, cognizant um, of of his ingredients. You know, um, uh, you know, being more cognizant of our own well being, being more cognizant that our, you know, social um, lives, you know, family, friends, our communities, and our cultures also play a really great and and, and potent part of our own flourishing. Um, is, is also just something that comes to mind as, as 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 a simple, yet potentially potent practice that we can um, embody. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Those are, um, that's really inspiring. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Yeah, those are all great. Um, gratitude is so huge. Gratitude practices and the Ella is huge. Um, you know, when you asked this question, Laura, what came to mind was yesterday, I heard somebody who was talking about sort of the um, aspects of flourishing, talking about health as, as an aspect, a really important measure for flourishing. And they said, um, are we really flourishing if we're bedridden? And that um, struck me, of course, with the work that I do, because it was a rhetorical question that meant maybe not. And I think there's really good reasons that we want to measure health and think about health in those ways, because of course, when we think about external factors that are reducing our possible health outcomes or environmental degradation that it reduce, you know, or environmental racism or all these other things that are reducing health outcomes, of course, that's, that's important for flourishing. We need to um, work, you know, that is a measure for flourishing in some ways. And and um, we're all going to, if we live long enough, you know, 78% of people over, over 55 have chronic conditions. We are going to eventually decline if we live long enough and eventually be bedridden. And so when you're asking about your question was, you know, practices that we can, we can do, I think that for all of us, we can work on thinking about aging and disability and the language we use and reimagine what a valuable human is. So often what happens in our discourse in the post-enlightenment, post-colonial spaces that we're in are that we imagine a human's value as someone who is being a person being valuable when they are able to be productive in this, you know, capitalist world, when they're able to be productive and, and independent and not rely on anyone and not be bedridden. But I think that if we really want to think about flourishing at all stages of the life course, we need to look at this stigma that emerges around disability and aging and look at communities, not just Catholic nuns, but communities around the world where humans are valued, where there's cultural practices that allow humans to be valued 
even when they're not being productive or independent. And so my advice or my sort of the practices that I think are most valuable for us to all of us to engage in are um, practices where we're um, reimagining how we value each other and integrating, you know, in multi-generational spaces, mm -hmm. integrating people who may be thinking about, I, I probably don't have enough time to get into this and I do in my writing, but the, there are practices that we could do to practice interdependence, for example, to practice valuing each other, even when we are just being, not when we're doing in the world. Um, and and accepting decline as and accepting that people who have declined are still valuable and still can have beautiful, fulfilling existences. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, thank you. And so we have some really good questions from the audience, and, and one of them relates to to one of the points you just made. And the question is, how can institutions, you know, such as universities, religious communities, uh, other organizations? Uh, nurture intergenerational work for flourishing, um, whether it's individual or communal. And does that seem like something that's important to you? I, I mean, I suspect you both do. Um, but are there, are there things that especially people in the audience can can help support to encourage intergenerational communication and, and flourishing work? Yeah, I, I don't have tangible things that are coming to my mind, but I think this is really crucial. And I think it's also really hard. Um, so many of our spaces in at least industrialized spaces are just set up to be so segregated. Children are segregated, older adults are segregated, D disabled folks are segregated. So there's this, this real structural thing that we're up against. Um, you know, certainly often religious communities are one of the very, very, very few places that we see real intergenerational connection. And I think that we, um, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, what would it look like for universities to have talks that include children and older adults? I mean, we're going to have to be a little bit flexible. It would be hard because children can be loud. <laughs> People, you know, there's, there's, it can be challenging, but I think that this um, space of intergenerational connection is is huge in terms of um, the potential for human flourishing. Yeah, I think just to echo that point, you know, um, as you know, someone who is an entrepreneur, obviously not in the academy, uh, I think one of the quite unfortunate things about the academy is is silos. You know, so um, you have even in, in in the same topic, you know, of like maybe flourishing while aging. You know, you have um, 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 silos, you know, so the psychologists think about it differently. The, the anthropologists and are on their own, you know, um, the neuroscientists are on their own, et cetera. And, and I think if we can find ways to create, you know, moments or communities that can break down the silos and um, just allow or facilitate for conversation, it doesn't have to be formal, you know, uh, but you know, just allowing for like some sort of a cross pollination of ideas behind, you know, from people of 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 of, of just different uh, schools of thought, even like on the very same topic, I think will be one way of of kind of like facilitating this. I think that's you know possibly one direction that universities can uh, and institutions can take is, um, I think we need to realize now that these you know kind of challenges that we are facing human flourishing is very interdisciplinary intergenerational cross-cultural etc um, and and great ideas great solutions are going to come out if we can allow them to to melt together and i think that's one thing that um universities can do institutions like templeton i think can also do um, um as well yeah, it just Thank occurred you. to me to add one more thing um, to this idea that it's actually the segregation that we do um, generationally is so unusual, right? And culturally, it's very unusual. So if we look around the world, um, I'm thinking, you know, if we, for example, I'm just thinking of Barbara Rogoff's work, who does, she's a developmental psychologist, who looks at how um, people across the life course, and she looks especially at children in indigenous spaces are completely integrated into everyday life. They learn to participate in uh, meaningfully in everyday life. And that's actually the norm for humans around the world and this sort of industrialized 
segregation thing is is unusual. So there, so what that tells us is that there's there's real potential and hope for creating intergenerational um, spaces. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both so much. So unfortunately, we're out of time. We could talk about this all day. Um, so Tom and Anna, thank you so much for your work on supporting human thriving um, in youth, in you know, across the lifespan and older people. It's been fascinating to hear about your experiences. And, and I hope everybody from the audience has, has taken away some, some inspiration and as well as some you know, practical advice. Uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the conference. We'll hand it over now. Um, thanks again to, to everybody in the audience for joining us. And thanks to our speakers. Good to, good to talk with you all. Thank you.